Hello friends, I want to welcome you once again to this particular presentation and I'm very happy I'm seeing quite a number of people joining us afresh. Once again, let me remind you we are dealing with disappointments and missed visions. The first day was such a wonderful time where we understood clearly that before visions become rare, there might have been several circumstances which necessitated those visions and when those visions have been given there are periods where because the visions need to be seen in terms of signs visions no longer do come about and in most cases are almost forgotten about tonight I would want us to continue in a perfectly different trajectory but let me quickly have a recap concerning what we discussed in our previous day our journey this particular moment conclusively we realized that israel as a nation spiritually and corporately served as lessons by which we can better understand when visions become rare friends of god we clarified that because visions had become rare it was clear that there was a transition period. Now, let me give you examples to augment what I'm saying. It is noteworthy in the Bible that Israel from Egypt, before Israel entered the period of the judges, God through Moses gave a lot of prophecies, a lot of visions concerning the lifestyle of Israel when they had entered Canaan. So there, there is this visions given the time of the Israelites from Egypt. Unfortunately, when they had now entered Canaan, where I call the liberal lifestyle of the Judges period, there were rare visions. In fact, visions were almost nowhere to be found. But we clearly understand that it was preparing those people then into a transition, what I classify as a transition into a kingdom rule. Once again, we have a replica where Israel came out of Babylon. And we see clearly through the accounts of the major and the minor prophets, people like Daniel, Habakkuk, Mika, Nahum, all these people during the time that Israel was moving out of Babylon gave several visions. Once again, after those visions were given, we can tell from the accounts of Israel and Nehemiah where I can also term that period as a liberal lifestyle of the post-colonial Israelites, there were rare visions. Visions were almost nowhere to be found. If you are following me closely, you can tell what is about to happen. The next line of action was the transition of Israel into the kingdom of grace of Christ, which we all know to be the first advent of Jesus Christ. In our current dispensation, as far as prophetic reckoning go, we can tell clearly that now spiritual Israelites, where you and I can find ourselves by faith, being descendants of Abraham, we know clearly that God has given a lot of visions when we as a people, during the time of the pioneers, during the time of the reformers, were coming out of spiritual Babylon. God gave several visions through them, and by that, they moved into another liberal lifestyle period, which you and I can find ourselves at the moment. The next line of action, once again, as we have gleaned from the previous examples, is that we are also transitioning to receive Christ's kingdom of glory. Where am I driving at? As we understood yesterday, conclusively, before visions or prophecies become rare, then we are sure to know that transition is near. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 through 10, we are told that whatever had been would be because there is nothing new under the sun. When Israel came out of Egypt, there were visions. But when they entered into the period of the judges, 
for about 350 years before the coronation of Saul as a king, there were no visions. Visions were rare. But prior or post that, there was a transition into a kingdom rule. We can perfectly link that to our current dispensation where we know there is a transition near. And as I have clearly stated, we are transitioning into Christ's kingdom of glory. The unfortunate thing is, people are becoming disappointed. Friends, you can tell for a fact there are several people around you, family members, relatives. We may even talk about our wives and our husbands who are very disappointed because we believe visions are rare. I have friends who ask me, why are we not hearing God's voice still in our ears as we have read from the Bible? Why are we not experiencing prophets who are predicting future events now in our current dispensation? And to add sword to injury, many people are now having the fear of even losing their own sense of living. In that, they believe that the God whom we have waited for for a long time is never coming. People are disappointed. Friends, today, tonight, this afternoon, morning, or evening, wherever you are, I want to present to you the pre-advent disappointment. And as I usually do, let me give you a prelude of some very important groundbreaking stories we have in this world. Do you know that when siblings or relatives join forces, their intimate understanding of one another's strengths, weaknesses, and aspirations can create a formidable synergy? Do you know that when two friends, even People from different walks of life come together. They force together and combine such that they shape industries and revolutionize technology. And we have several examples of that. Let me delve deeper. History tells us that in the 1900s, there were these people called the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright. In the field of avi aviation, we are told that Orville and Robert Wright are credited with inventing and building the world's first successful powered airplane. I believe you are following me very closely. They built the powerful airplane and on December 17, 1903, they achieved the first controlled and sustained flight of a powered heavier than air aircraft. It is written that they did this in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. It is very clear, according to the progressions of the story, that the Wright brothers included the development of three axis control. Don't worry yourself if you don't understand the technological ways. But all I'm trying to say is that the Wright brothers continue to improve their designs and perform longer and more controlled flights. Together, the Wright brothers brought in aircrafts into the world. Many of us millennials and Generation Z people have the opportunity to have enjoyed several media resources, cartoons and movies through what we call the Warner Brothers, Harry, Albert, Sam, and Jack Warner. In the entertainment industry, we who are very privy to several movies previously know that there is a particular caveat for a particular niche, a group of people known as the Warner Bros. Studios. The four Warner Brothers founded Warner Bros. Pictures, which was incorporated in 1923, becoming one of the major film studios in Hollywood. We are told that the Warner Bros. Studios released the Jazz Singer, the first feature-length motion picture which synchronized dialogue sequences. It was a groundbreaking film achievement. Over the decades, Warner Bros. has produced numerous iconic films and television shows, which you and I probably, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, have watched over the years. Time may permit me to also talk about the Koch brothers, Charles and David Koch. In the field of commerce, an industry, how I wish I could project for you to see the pictures. But hear me out, because I would want you to, to reason with me. The Koch brothers 
who happened to be Charles and David Koch, expanded their father's company known as the Koch Industries into one of the largest privately owned companies in the United States of America. Their business interests included refining chemicals and biofuels. History has it that they had invested heavily in innovative processes and technologies. Someone will ask, where is this guy driving at? Friend of God, where I'm driving at is very simple. I am trying to paint a very important picture. Imprint it in your mind that when two or three people come together to form an alliance with a common motive, it is very, very difficult to break them asunder. And one important factor that we learn from such a conglomerate is that when two people come together, they get to know themselves better, even at times being able to predict the next move of the other. For the purpose of our discourse, I cannot overlook the likes of Simeon and Levi, who together rampantly destroyed the family of Shechem when Shechem had raped their sister. I can also talk about the formative powers of Moses and Aaron during the 40 years of wilderness experience. Again, New Testament presents to us the formidable union of the sons of Zebedee, James and John. However, in the Holy Scriptures, one relation stands out, and that is John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. John the Baptist and Jesus had significant connections biologically, prophetically, and corporately. We know, according to the account of Luke chapter 1 verse 36, that the angel Gabriel, when announcing the birth of Jesus to Mary, mentions even Elizabeth, I'm quoting, your relative is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. It is clear that Gabriel indicated that Mary, who happens to be Jesus' mother, and Elizabeth, who happens to be John's mother, were relatives, traditionally understood as cousins. In the corporate sense, these two were also interwoven. The Bible clearly depicts that John the Baptist's ministry was centered on calling people to repentance and baptizing them as a symbol of purification and preparation for the coming Messiah. It is clear according to John chapter 1 verse 29 that he publicly announced Jesus as the Lamb of God, recognizing Jesus' superior and divine role. Mutual recognition and respect was something that was found between these two. But unfortunately, and this is the climax of tonight's or this day's presentation, amidst all of this, John even sacrificing the bond with Christ at a point in his life was disappointed. How could John be disappointed? Even though, as we are going to discover, prophecies and all forms of understanding pointed to the fact that he perfectly knew who Jesus Christ was. And as we have understood, corporate-wise, he knew Christ. In the context of biological relation, he also knew Christ. So what happened? How could John the Baptist, of all people, be disappointed? Before we can perfectly answer this question, and as you may have well noticed, I have given PowerPoints to tonight's presentation. These happen to be the objectives as I delve deeper. We are discovering that we can have people who are more than a family. And in the same vein, by being more than a family, can know the timing of the successes and the downturns of the other. In the case of John and Jesus Christ, we can also learn that there can be disappointments amidst enough evidences. And for our case, these reckonings and these analyses can be a template for our time. Friends, I believe you are following. According to the Bible, and as I always say, to better understand messages, it has to be captured through the lenses 
of prophetic and sanctuary devices. Jesus enters the court, and we know perfectly that Jesus left heaven and approached the world from the east to dissipate the darkness that had overwhelmed it. Note this very well. Jesus Christ came from the east, and it is no surprise that he did that. Follow me as I quote these remarkable quotes from the Bible. Luke chapter 1 verse 78 and 79. We are told, through the tender mercies of our God, with which the day spring, and when I say day spring, I mean the rising sun, from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. Do you know that according to Old Testament prophecy, The priest who lived in the camp and officiated in the sanctuary was to be without blemish. It is perfectly captured in Leviticus 21 verse 21. Once again, we know that this particular burnt offering, don't forget I'm speaking in the context of sanctuary service. When the priest came into the tabernacle, he had to put the altar of burnt offering, which was originally inspired by God, before the door of the holy place, in this case the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and offered upon it the burnt offering and the grain offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. How did Jesus Christ fulfill this? We are told in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 that at a certain point in Bible prophecy, Jesus Christ came into this world. But you'll be amazed to know that the wise men who descend the Messiah's star in the heavens, according to Matthew chapter 2, verse 2 to 10, and by the words of Simeon at dedication in Luke chapter 2, 25 to 32, the prophecy of the 70 weeks would give the precise year for the anointing of the Messiah. Fortunately, the greatest anointment of the arrival of the Messiah was given by John the Baptist. It is no surprise. But this is one thing I want you to note. Remember we told or we have discovered that the tabernacle which was being ministered unto by the priest. The priest in this case had to come from the east where he would render upon the altar of burnt offering the sacrifice. According to John chapter 1 verse 14, we are told that the word became flesh. This particular Sentence becoming flesh from the etymology where it was written implies that the word had tabernacled or pitched his tent with us. Thus, Jesus Christ came to live with us in the sanctuary encampment. Already, we find in the Old Testament in Exodus 25, verse 8, that God wanted a sanctuary where he would dwell in the midst of his people. But where can we find a very important statement? The most important statement we can find is clearly when John the Baptist had publicly proclaimed that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God. Friends, in John chapter 1 verse 29, John proclaimed, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was an unblemished lamb. This was Jesus Christ being ushered into the world by John the Baptist. According to the principle of the Old Testament sanctuary service. Now, let me remind you, if you have not heard anything at all up until this time, I have made three very significant points. Number one, John was intimately related to Jesus Christ. Number two, The prophecies of the Old Testament sanctuary services, even regarding the exact cardinal points, that is the east, from where the priest was supposed to minister, even the tribe of Judah was located at the east side of the encampment. Jesus Christ, clearly from the Bible, was ushered in from the east when he was described by the wise men in the times of Matthew. That is where we are. At the moment and as I continue you are going to realize we both are going to clearly glean that indeed John had known 
that these prophecies were being fulfilled. Because we are told, as the later apostles came also to understand, Jesus himself, the unblemished priest, according to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. The Bible says, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. We can also talk about the account according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we were. Someone who is carefully following me will ask, how is this related to disappointment? And especially as our topic displays, the pre-advent disappointment. If you are like such, you keep quiet and follow me closely. According to Malachi chapter 2 verse 3, the Bible says, Behold, I send the messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming. Friends, John's message was directly in contravention with several leadership in the time of Jesus. But it does not take away the fact that it caused great commotion among the people in the vast geographical extension. Because we are told in Matthew 3 verse 5 and 6, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. The Desire of Ages, page 104, tells us, The whole nation was stirred. Multitudes flocked to the wilderness. But the question is, how do we still say there was a disappointment? The Bible clarifies, and it is topped up by the expositions from the writings of Ellen White, that John did not comprehend his own words when Jesus came to be baptized. Desire of Ages, page 112, tells us, None among the hearers, and not even the speaker himself, discerned the import of these words, the lamp of God. Friends of God, John did not fully understand the work that Jesus was going to perform as the lamp of God. He did not comprehend the fact that Messiah's kingdom will come in two stages. That is, he was mistaken about the kind of kingdom that Jesus was going to establish. Why? He expected a temporal kingdom on earth. Could you believe that? If you have forgotten, let me remind you that I started off by proclaiming clearly that when friends come together, they can know themselves so intimately that one can be predicted from the other. But here we are, John, who is biologically related to Christ, and corporate-wise is intertwined with the ministry of Christ, did, nev- did not understand nor comprehend the message that God had called him to proclaim. Matthew 3 verse 12, the Bible tells us, His renowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Ellen White confirms he did not fully understand what he was even talking about. Desire of Ages, page 136. During the weeks that followed, that is, the weeks that followed the baptism of Jesus, John, with a new interest, studied the prophecies and the teaching of the sacrificial service. He did not distinguish clearly the phases of Christ's work as a suffering sacrifice and a conquering king. But he saw that his coming had a deeper significance than priests or people had discerned. There was a bitter disappointment. John was deeply disappointed when Christ did not come according to his expectations. And how do we clarify this? According to Matthew chapter 11 verse 2 and 3, we are told, And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Like the Savior's disciples, 
John the Baptist did not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom. He was disappointed. But fortunately, although John was bitterly disappointed, he did not lose faith. This is the tradition and the current state of most people who one way or the other represent the lifestyle of John in our current dispensation. Let me take you back to our PowerPoints. Many of us fill the spot of John the Baptist in our current way of life. We are more than a family in that some of us probably were even born into the church. Some of us are closely knitted to the clergy. Some of us have a proper familiarization with several pastors and administrators in the church. We are more than family. But we are also privileged to have seen the impeccable timing of Jesus Christ. The pre-advent visions, the pre-advent prophecies concerning the coming of the Son of Man, even so precise that the Bible clarifies that Jesus Christ came from the East. I told you in the beginning that the tribe of Judah was geographically positioned on the east side of the tabernacle. You and I know clearly, and we need no reference to prove that, Jesus Christ was the son out of the tribe of Judah. He came from the east. Again, it is very clear, even as to the particular town he was coming from, where Micah tells us that Bethlehem Ephrathah, that is where the king would come from. We as a people, like Israel of old, have seen the impeccable timing of Jesus Christ. Well, unfortunately, we do not know when he will come precisely, but the visions have been given. However, there have been disappointments and mis evidences that we have. Many of us, have, have, as I've already clarified, are disappointed in our quest of life. Personally, I've had several devastating experiences where I wish I could move forward in life, but disappointment upon disappointment have been always put in my way. And I know you equally share those sentiments, but I want to encourage you that this is a template for our life. Wherever you are, it is clear that even amidst disappointments, we have a template by which we can always rationalize our existence in this current world of ours. Friends, this is the pre-advent disappointment of John. Do you know that we are also in the threshold within the same period where visions are rare? And like the time of John the Baptist, even before him, when for about 400 years, that is the intertestamental period, after visions had become rare, many people were disappointed and that were not able to receive Christ when he had come. You and I are also disappointed. It is no surprise that pastors are running after degrees upon degrees. It is no surprise that people hate the work of auditors even in the church. It is no surprise that you are seen in the particular light when you want accountability in the church. Many people are thriving on the treasuries of the church. And it is no surprise that each and every day, because people are disappointed, we want to move in directions which even do not augment our salvation path. Where are we going? Clarification by scripture tells us, that John was given a very important answer. After healing the blind, the lame, the lepers, the deaf, raising the dead and preaching the gospel to the poor in the presence of John's disciples, Jesus told them to go tell John what they had witnessed. He told them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind are seeing. The lame are walking. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf are hearing, the deaf are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Matthew chapter 11, verse 3 and 5. My question is, are we seeing these things happen in our day? Even though we are befalled 
by the pre-advent disappointment, Jesus Christ tells us that these things are still happening. Not long ago, the church witnessed one of the most momentous baptismal occasions in the history of this world. More than 100,000 people, after being pierced through the heart by the gospel, gave themselves to Christ in Papua New Guinea. Deaf people were hearing. Even in our own small towns and our own small crevices, we see miracles happening even though visions are rare. And concerning this, Desire of Ages, page 224, tells us, Though miraculous deliverance was granted John, there was no miraculous deliverance granted him. He was not forsaken. He had always the companionship of heavenly angels who opened to him the prophecies concerning Christ and the precious promises of Scripture. Friend, once again, if you heard nothing at all, these are the points I have built as I bring the curtains to a close for tonight or this afternoon's presentation. Number one, it is perfectly clear as we have reckoned from the several things that we have discussed that our time is characteristic of visions which are rare. But we have understood clearly that before these visions have become rare, especially in our time, like Israel of old, God gave visions so that they could tell us what are supposed to happen in the future. Before those visions are realized, signs take place which tell the informed ones, those who have connected themselves with God, what to do and the period in which they are. I gave examples that Israel from Egypt received visions, but between the time of the death of Joshua and the time of the coronation of Saul as the first king, there were relatively less visions because people were living anyhow. We were living liberal lifestyles back then. And we have understood that it was a time of transition into the kingdom rule. Most recently, in the context of spiritual Israel, like I said earlier, we had visions by which, through interpretation, the church left the Catholic system, the Babylonian in spirituality, and lived liberal lifestyle. Reminiscent of the time of the judges. Like once again, visions were rare, even as it stands now. But we are being reminded that as it has been in the previous times, currently we are now on the threshold of a transition to receive Christ's kingdom of glory. Tonight has hammered the nail right on the head. That even as we thrive in these times of rarity of visions, like John the Baptist, no matter how close we have built a connection with Christ, we can be very much disappointed. Because, like Israel of old, within the intertestamental period, more than 400 years, because they couldn't well familiarize themselves with understanding the visions, they were disappointed, and John being the number one out of them all. In our current dispensation, we also face the same tragedy of having a pre-advent disappointment. And unfortunately, we are seeing this happen day in, day out. As I bring my presentation to an end, I want to clarify that whatever that is happening now is reminiscent of what we have seen previously in times of old. But the good news is, as we saw that God never left John the Baptist, God has also not left us. When we are ready to comprehend, when we are ready to hold fast, then I can assure you that even though we may be disappointed, we will come out having enough evidences to continue the life that is ahead of us. Friends, I want to end this particular discourse so that we can enter into about 10 minutes season of prayer. I know you have heard a lot and I was trying as hard as I can to proclaim in the context of a prophecy and vision as well as 
describing the current times in which we are. There are a lot of conclusions you are drawing on a personal level. But that is the more reason why we ought to pray and we ought to connect with God more and more each and every day. You can tell me that you have garnered prayer points by listening to this gist of the more interesting presentations that are awaiting us in the future. Personally, I have understood that, Father, I can be disappointed. It is no news. It is no news to be disappointed in our current age. That is my first prayer point. My second prayer point is a thanksgiving prayer point. Because I have enough evidence to encourage me to move forward even though I may be disappointed. Prayer point number two for me. The third prayer point is that I am encouraged that there is a transitioning such that I am going to soon enough, just as Israel of old, during the period where visions were rare, see Christ and I'll be glad to see him. Three very important prayer points and I believe you also have garnered yours.